I worked to try to get the attention of our president, even though I, I wasn't a big fan at the time. I got so fed up that uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky and I, uh, we focused the Fox News story right at the White House. <laughs> and we took a, a Fox News reporter on a stroll, a tour of Skid Row. And it hit its mark because I guess he was watching it. The president was watching it. And his aides were trying to talk to him. He said, quit talking to me. I'm, I'm watching this. The incredible Reverend Andy Bales actually got the President of the United States' attention. He shares that story and others uh, in this second interview. He talks about what's happening at a legal level to support his efforts that demand immediate housing for the homeless. And please be sure to stick around to the end. Andy shares his why. What is it that inspired him? Why does he do this work? where he's so incredibly helpful to the homeless. Stick around, I think you'll like it. looking toward as pivotal events or critical that something happened. When you're looking out, I'd like you to look forward a little bit for yeah. me. Federal Judge David Carter, uh, if the city and the county will live up to the settlements that they just made, Federal Judge David Carter called for an injunction. He demanded immediate shelter and housing for everybody on Skid Row, right? And a certain percentage, 60% off of Skid Row. So, so not everybody came from Skid Row, is on Skid Row. We need them to find escape elsewhere because this is a disaster zone, right? Our city and our county took him all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court to, to fight him on immediately housing and sheltering. Well, just the other day, they did finally settle. They quit fighting and said, okay, judge, we'll give in. But the city is still stuck on a very expensive, uh, slowly developed million dollar units and I don't think the judge will tolerate it much longer. And I certainly don't tolerate it. We need immediate shelter and then innovative, affordable housing, like 3D printed homes and mobile homes and container homes. There's a lot of proposals out there yeah. out there and resist. And we could and we could do it, right? Mm -hmm. I believe we're making progress despite all the fight. The the most accurate barometer unfortunate barometer for our collective failure is that five, more than five people per day die of homelessness in LA every day. 1,600 or every four years, it's more than 6,000 people. So while they wait for an expensive unit to develop, 6,000 people die on the streets. I worked to try to get the attention of our president, even though I I wasn't a big fan at the time. I got so fed up that uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky and I, uh, we focused the Fox News story right at the White House. <laughs> and we took a, a Fox News reporter on a stroll and tour of Skid Row. And it hit its mark because I guess he was watching it. The president was watching it. And his aides were trying to talk to him. He said, quit talking to me. I'm, I'm watching this. <laughs> and so the next thing I knew, four people from the White House were in my office. 15 people came on a tour with me of Skid Row. Well, then the president came and Ben Carson came. And there was talk of working with the Dream Center and the Salvation Army and us on a, a faith-based approach and giving us federal land and state land and doing a FEMA-like response and bringing people in. And nothing came of it because every city official and every county official except one said that if you give those faith-based groups that kind of resources, they will have to defaith. If you run it through us, right, they will have to defaith. Well, some groups have defaithed or moved away from faith and recovery. Uh, and 
and in my opinion, have kind of lost their mission. But we have not lost our faith. In fact, uh, we're still trying to focus on bringing that kind of a FEMA-like approach to rescue as many people as we can in satellites uh, throughout uh, L.A. County. And it was a it was a missed opportunity. I mean, it was a good try. <laughs> it was a long shot, but uh, we still need a FEMA-like approach in, in Los Angeles. Talking to the world, talking to people, anybody, Americans, Los Angelinos, anybody. What is your message? How can, how can they help? Yeah, well, it's what I've always said is treat someone when you meet them like you would a friend, right? So that's a starting point. Yeah, look them in the eye, say hi, and uh, begin to hear their story, and then try to connect them with services that will actually help them. Become aware of the programs around you that might be doing good work, that, you know, that are actually helping people turn their lives around and get connected, and, and then... Try to connect them. But so, I, yeah, I but say, instead, if somebody's asking for, for money on a corner, don't give them money. Yeah. Take them to lunch, give them food, and hear their story, and you know, try to connect them with, with help. What can someone do? Okay, that's a starting point. Bare minimum, we treat people with dignity and respect, and we we keep them connected to us as a community, and we treat them as our brothers and sisters. No question. But politically, is there is there something that we should be asking for? Yeah, uh, where where and who is helping people get a hand up uh, and become productive again, rather than leaving like leaving them in their current situation uh, forever? Right. So, just give you a quick illustration: Alberta, Canada, has launched a recovery movement. They meet people where they are, right where they are, like with, with harm-reducing services. And they make a distinction. We meet you where you are addicted, and then we want to get you to on the road to recovery, right? Recovery to being productive and recovery to being socially reintegrated until you come out on the other side a better person. Vancouver, British Columbia... They're like L.A. They're the harm reduction, free flow of alcohol and drugs. And they want to meet you where you are and leave you right there and help you with safe injection sites and, and come and, and safe supply of drugs and leave you where you are. Well, the overdose deaths in, in Alberta are dropping where the overdose deaths in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, they're, they're going up. And in L.A., they're going up. Find the Albertas okay. of the world yep. and the people pushing that recovery movement yep. and get behind them yep. and tell these folks, wake up. We, don't, we can't afford to leave people in that addictive state for the rest of their lives and subsidize them. In that state, right? It costs more for the community as well. Too. Yes. It's, just, it's, bad, it's bad for them, bad for us. It's bad for everybody right. because pretty soon you have the tenderloin in San Francisco that's out of control. You have Skid Row in Los Angeles. Four guys got shot in the park last night, a block from here. Somebody got shot there last week. It, it's it's a disaster. And we, are, we, we knew the day when in L.A., this was only in Skid Row. Now it's in every neighborhood in L.A. that there are encampments that are in every neighborhood. And it's coming to a neighborhood near you. Well, it's, this, in, it's in Palm Springs. If this kind of thinking continues, I don't, I don't get political. I'm nonpartisan. But if this kind of very progressive, no rules, free for all. Continues. Right. There needs to be a We're balanced here. approach. Yes. There needs to be a balanced approach. Yes. Law, well, uh, there is a need for law and order. And there, there's a need for uh, a huge carrot, right, uh, to, to get help. And then followed by, uh, I, I don't want to say stick, but strong encouragement not to stay in the condition that you're in on the streets. And in L.A., we haven't even made a half halfway effort to, to provide enough beds. Uh, there is no place in the country 
that has the shortage of places to go like Los Angeles. We have 50 some thousand people on the streets. No, no city in the country comes close. Maybe there's 2,000 in Atlanta, 3,400 in New York on the streets, uh, 3,000 in Houston on the streets. No place comes close to 50,000 on the streets. And it's because we just got, we just got 60 million from the government uh, to help the unsheltered, and yet not one shelter bed is developed out of that 60 million. Where'd it go? Uh, it's going to the very expensive permanent housing. Yeah. We have uniquely failed. I, I looked at a note the other day, I think three or four years ago, it was three people per day were dying. Well, when you get to five or five and a half per day, that's, that's an accurate picture of how badly we are failing to address homelessness. I do this because uh, my dad experienced homelessness between the ages of four and 17. I should have naturally done this, right? Shouldn't have dreamed about being a ball player or, or any of the dreams I had. My dad, his last week on the face of the earth, all he could talk about was the shame and pain and embarrassment of being that homeless kid. And uh, that should have been enough motivation for me to do this right away. But it took me, I was a school teacher and, and pastor and I was teaching a, a group of kids and they were picking on somebody in the classroom who they thought was a loser and a nerd and calling them all those names from the 80s. And I said, knock it off. Don't treat somebody like that in my classroom. Uh, but I went home that night and I thought, you know, if a, a youngster can't find love in this classroom, what, we're in this tough world that we're going to find it. So I went home and studied my Bible. I found the scripture that says the way you treat another human being is the way that you're treating God himself. If if you feed somebody who's hungry, it's like feeding Jesus himself. If you turn your back on somebody who's hungry, it's like turning your back on Jesus himself. I went back and shared it with the kids. I shared it six times with, with six classes. And I, theologians say I stretch it, but I said, I believe the way you treat another human is the way you're treating God himself. And if you hurt that, if you say a hurting word to an already hurting person, it's like saying a hurting word to God himself. And if anybody wants to argue with me, just ask yourself, what's the worst thing anybody could do to you as a parent, right? Mistreat your kids. And so I shared that message with the kids six times. Uh, they heard it once, but I, I heard it six times. And uh, talk, talk to them about how important it is to feed the hungry. Well, that weekend I was at a second job at a parking ramp, and a homeless guy walked up to me, up to the window and knocked. and. I'm sitting there with my sandwich. He's carrying a bag of soda pop cans, long, dirty coat, long, dirty beard. And he said, sir, can I have your sandwich? And of course, after preaching that message six times on Friday, I said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but I need my sandwich. And his face drooped with disappointment and he disappeared into the darkness. And I realized, man, did I blow it, right? Preached message six times. I uh, thought it was so good, and then I didn't, I, I failed the practice. So a few weeks later, I found him on the street and fed him dinner. Then a few weeks after that, the missions pastor at church said, Andy, there's a job opening at the downtown mission. I think you should go apply. And so that's, you know, that's what happened when I reluctantly went to apply for the job. I walked in a mission that was totally different than the picture I had in my mind. And uh, that's how I found my I found my calling by failing to practice what I preached. And I've just been trying to practice what I preached for these last 36 years. And uh, every kid I see, I see my dad and, then, you know, who became a resilient, wonderful guy, great dad. And uh, I know that these kids here can become the same.